Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Natalia Martin and I'll be a moderator for this webinar. Uh, today we have a very exciting topic. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, top 10 OT ICS uh, cyber attacks of 2023. Our panelist is uh, Rhys Maktimas. Uh, he's a director of uh, industrial security here at Waterfall Security Solutions. And he's also a principal researcher on our annual threat report. Couple of, <clears throat> sorry, couple of notes before we start. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, an email with the link to the recording will be sent out uh, to all of you within the coming days. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Please make sure you submit your questions uh, into a Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen uh, at any time during the session. We will try to answer uh, all of your questions, but of course, you know, sometimes we're running out of time, so uh, we'll try to reach out to you individually uh, via email. And with that, uh, turning the stage over to you, Reese. Thank you so much, Natalia, for that amazing intro. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining this waterfall webinar today. This is, in fact, our last webinar of the year that we will be hosting at Waterfall. And I welcome you all here. This is great to see you. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about threats to physical operations and share with you my take that is founded in hard work, in data, and in analytics. And when I say that it's my take, it's because picking a top 10 is somewhat arbitrary. Um, I get to look through all the incidents we've collected this year so far and pick 10 that I think tell a story and are most impactful, most the most notorious attacks, uh, the most impactful attacks that we've seen so far this year. So first of all, I want to start off by setting the stage. Um, the incidents that you see here uh, get compiled for our annual waterfall threat report. Now, uh, for those that have not seen our existing <laughs> waterfall threat reports before, uh, let's talk quickly about them. You can, first of all, go and download our 2023 threat report using the QR code or the URL here at the bottom of your screen. I highly recommend you go and read this. Uh, I believe that everybody should know about this threat report. It is extremely useful. It's very, very popular. It's probably our most top downloaded item on our website. And what the report tracks are deliberate attacks, not errors and omissions with physical consequences to operations. This was a deliberate choice. There are many reports out there that highlight attacks on IT systems, on OT systems, on both. Um, some of those are based on private information that are not in the public record. And that's why we've chosen to focus on industries and areas of concern to OT and ICS cybersecurity practitioners that are in the public record that are verifiable industries that we understand. And, you know, a quick note about what we don't cover, because this often gets asked, how come you don't cover, let's say, healthcare? Well, hospitals and, and medical, for example, while they are critical infrastructure, because their technology and IT systems are built and operated very differently, than industrial automation sites that we and, and many of our customers are familiar with, uh, they're harder to cover. And there are a lot of them. They are significant and they are attacks on critical infrastructure, but they, they look very differently. A another example of an industry that looks very different than um, a typical OT or ICS environment is perhaps a retail or warehouse environment. Many of those on the retail side um, are changing. They are changing to more automation and more integration, but still they're mostly point of sale building systems um, that are not heavily automated and rely on a lot of uh, human and manual labor like at the till. And so many of these kind of industries are just not covered in this report. And what we do cover is shown here on the screen. So you can go ahead and read those. Um, 
lastly, this report is purposefully designed to be the most conservative, most unambiguous, and where the incidents just simply cannot be discounted. And we firmly believe here at Waterfall that understanding past incidents allows us to better defend our operations tomorrow. And we're always looking for feedback, always looking to refine this process and our threat report that we release annually. We very much appreciate that. So if you have any questions that aren't answered here in this webinar today, please make sure you ask those questions. You can do it, as Natalia said, through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can email us at any time, info at waterfall-security.com. And we're happy to answer any questions and take any feedback. One question we're often asked is, what do these attacks on operations look like, actually? How did they occur? You know, were they really attacks on OT? And that's a good question, because what we care about are consequences to operations. And the good news is, is we've done a lot of new work here in threat reporting this year that you will see in the upcoming 2024 threat report that attempt to answer this question, address this question, you know, how do these attacks occur? How do attackers penetrate into OT networks and impact them? And so what we've done is we've come up with a classification system that we call an OT attack type. And this is something we've defined. It's a mechanism or pathway by which a cyber attack has impacted the OT network. And this is just not in the 2023 report so far. We've gone ahead and done that for all incidents since 2010 and going forward. And some of the things that uh, we look at is, was this a direct attack on OT? Was it a direct attack and there's evidence of no or poor segmentation in networks, which basically means that the network is one, i.e. a flat networking model? Was, was this an indirect attack? Did the attack pivot from IT into the OT network? What, uh, did the attack impact the OT network because of a dependency? You know, the IT network has services and, and pieces that the OT network relies on and depends on and without them it simply can't function was it a shutdown out of an abundance of caution this is an indirect method of shutting down an ot network if the it network and the business as a whole shuts down you know unplugs network switches and cables uh, in a cabinet this is a, a deliberate choice where you shut down an abundance of caution sometimes uh, because you simply lack the confidence in your security program so these are the kind of things we looked at, uh, and we've now classified them all. But Reese, you say, you know, that's nice. I came here for the top 10. Where is it? Yes, of course, we're getting to that. Okay. And so let's let's begin. Let's dive straight in to our top 10 cyber attacks. Um, I've organized these chronologically. It's a timeline. So let's go ahead and look at what I believe are the most impactful incidents here in 2023. All right, so first one that occurred on February 23rd was a major cyber attack on the Dole Food Company. Now, um, for those that may not be in North America or may not know what Dole does, uh, Dole is a huge player and you know produces produce, global fresh produce producers. So they produce both vegetables and most famously fruits that are sold throughout grocers and retailers across the world, actually. They're a global company. And, uh, you know, they're most famous for their pineapple farm in Hawaii. If you're a tourist, you've been to Hawaii on holiday, you've probably been able to go buy and eat and enjoy fresh pineapples at one of their farms. This is, this is kind of what makes them iconic. Um, you know, a cyber attack on the food and beverage industry is particularly impactful, especially on a company like Dole. It's a difficult time for retailers and consumers right now in, in North America anyways, and in most parts of the world, inflation has deeply affected everybody and, and the and supply chain issues, including in food and beverage are, are quite significant. Um, you know, this the selection, you know, the grocery store has been poor, uh, foodborne illness outbreaks have been common. And sometimes, sometimes they're traced to food and beverage uh, companies that, that produce, let's say, you know, pre-cut and pre-packaged fruit and vegetables. And so this February 23rd ransomware attack on Dole was a big deal. 
And uh, right after the attack, uh, the company was quite good, actually. They, they immediately responded to the incident. They stated that uh, the Dole Food Company is in the midst of a cyber attack, and we have subsequently shut down our systems throughout North America. And then they go on to say that, um, you know, they will operate manually through uh, what they called their manual backup program, if needed, in order to continue operations. They also said something that uh, I believe is worth noting. They said at the time when this first happened that um, that they were expecting it would be unlikely to recover costs um, through their insurance plan as insurance, cybersecurity insurance was getting prohibitively expensive and difficult to obtain. Um, what we know is that later on in May, they made an SEC Security and Exchange Commission disclosure filing and they revealed that the attack ended up costing them $10.5 million in costs, which included about $4.8 million to in order to continue operations. So that $4.8 million was a part of the total 10.5. And Basically, these continuing uh, continuing operation costs included uh, restoration and and costs relating to getting uh, about half of their legacy servers and a quarter of their end user computers up and running again. They never did disclose what what or who the threat actor was, other than it was ransomware. Uh, and it's possible that they might have paid a ransom because they didn't disclose and no threat actor took responsibility for this attack. So oftentimes you see that in these kinds of cases, um, you know, there might have been a ransom paid in order to keep this quiet. Um, but this was a pretty big deal. Um, an attack on a food producer this large, uh, you know, meant that people didn't have food to eat in the grocery store for weeks and we're having trouble sourcing things like fresh fruits and vegetables. All right, that is the first one of the year. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the second most impactful incident of the year occurred at SAF Holland on March 25th. What is SAF Holland? Well, they're uh, a European-based, based in Germany, manufacturer, of heavy commercial vehicle and, and parts. And so they produce large systems like uh, tractors and trailers, like the chassis for these kinds of vehicles and related parts. Um, SAF and Holland may be familiar to those in the trucking industries. Uh, Holland and, and SAF merged in 2005 to form SAF Holland. And uh, they chose to keep the headquarters of the former U.S. Holland company in, in uh, move it to Germany. And so they are actually a, quite a large player in the manufacturing of, of heavy equipment in the automotive business. Um, when they were hit by a cyber attack, uh, it halted production in multiple locations. And we know this because they said so in a filing to the European regulators. So uh, similar to in the US or in other countries, like in London, in, in the UK, at, at the London Stock Exchange, there's now more of an obligation than ever before that if there are material impacts to your business, that you must uh, declare them if you're a publicly traded company. And such is the case here with SAF Holland in Europe. So here they had to make a Article 17 5.96 or slash 2014 slash EU MAR disclosure. What's an MAR disclosure? This this regulation is designed uh, under a what they call market abuse regulation um, framework, which means that companies basically have to be clear and transparent about any material impacts to their business. So here it is. Um, this was an estimate by the company. We never did find out what the total downtime was in this incident. Uh, it's simply not available in public news or information sources. I couldn't find any employee or other reports of this incident. Uh, so the only other thing we know is that it's a Alf v. Black Cat ransomware incident. Um, Alf v. Black Cat is a um, ransomware software as a service type of 
malware that can be purchased uh, by anybody with money on the dark web. And uh, this is this is what we know about this incident. It was quite impactful. Let's move on to the next one. The third one of the year, the most impactful. Uh, this is a very notorious incident and will actually end up becoming very important later this year. And, and let me go on to explain why. So here on April 9th, um, we have a situation that is, is different than the previous other incidents we saw. This is a hacktivist attack instead of a ransomware attack. Now, what had occurred here? So GoSec galil sewage who are these people um galil sewage is a wastewater treatment plant that's located in the jordan valley in israel this is in northern israel it's surrounded by a lot of agricultural farmland and in this same incident uh, farms were also impacted uh, that have irrigation pump controllers and these pump controllers are all controlled by the same brand of of controller made by a company called unitronics they're israeli based they make actually quite a nice product. It's a PLC and HMI combined all into one with a control panel. And, you know, they're commercially available for people that do automation and control systems. I'm sure you've seen similar or these, these very controllers yourselves when you've walked around plants or installed them yourselves. And um, unfortunately, they're, they're vulnerable. Now, as with most hacktivist attacks, they're politically motivated. In this case, uh, the Op Israel campaign is a campaign that uh, occurs every year uh, with regular frequency and is well known uh, by people in the region in the Middle East. Um, many people pile onto this campaign, and it's a uh, it's been a year year after year event where effectively. People on the internet get together and uh, attempt or successfully hack uh, Israel and Israeli companies, Israeli critical infrastructure, uh, because they disagree with with Israel from a political point of view. In this case, uh, GoSec is is mostly unknown. We know about their name because they basically publicly came out and said that they carried out this attack, and they took advantage of well known vulnerabilities in Unitronics controllers. And the fact that they have default passwords and that many of these operators that, that own Unitronics controllers and pumps connect these things directly to the internet. What's particularly notable about this attack is the Israeli government um, and their national cyber directorate, which is a government agency, went around weeks before this actually occurred and warned all the farms and Galil Sewage Company and other companies in the region to make sure they went and disconnected all their controllers from the internet. It sounds like most of these operators really like the remote control features of these controllers, like to plug them into the internet, and may or may not have very strong cybersecurity protection uh, between them and the internet. Uh, if they have firewalls, uh, clearly they were breached in these cases. The controllers were defaced, their splash screen was changed to, to say down with Israel and all kinds of negative messaging. And basically they were bricked. And, and so for the farms that were able to manually operate and bypass their pumps, they were fine. For Galil Sewage, they lost a day of uh, water treatment. And because they also seem to be supplying irrigation water uh, out uh, outside of after their, after their treatment, um, some irrigation and distribution was also impacted in the Jordan Valley at this time. And why is this important? We'll see later on in the year, um, which is not in this top 10 today, because it basically happened after I put together all these incidents. This month, just this month, we saw um, Aliquippa in Pennsylvania, uh, in the USA, impacted by the same vulnerability, the same MO, um, but a different threat actor took responsibility. Um, Cyber Avengers took responsibility for that attack. So we, we see the same attack occurring later on elsewhere in the world. Also, just this week, um, Erie, Erie Water, which is a, a very tiny operator in Ireland, suffered the same fate um, where I believe they had Unitronics controllers. It was reported in the press they were Eurotronics controllers, but I'm quite sure they were Unitronics controllers because the incident and the circumstances are nearly identical. All right, let's move on to the next incident that we have 
in 2023. The fourth one I'd like to talk about is a what was dubbed a network intrusion event at Baden Steelworks. So Baden Steelworks, or BSW, is one of the largest steel producers in Europe. They're located in uh, Baden-Württemberg in Germany, um, which is um, effectively one of the major industrial heartlands in Germany. They have electric arc furnaces, so they're, they're electric-fired steel plants where they smelt iron ore and other ingredients in order to make molten steel and produce high quality steel. A lot of the steel is actually produced um, from recyclables. So you'll have other vehicles and other large bits of steel, perhaps from the shipping industry that all get cut up, salvaged and put into these uh, units. And the electric arc furnaces then fire up and turn this into brand new steel. Um, very, very big producer. And this is what we call process manufacturing, where you have raw ingredients that get processed and, and manufactured into a final product. In this case, uh, the threat actor is unknown. It was just simply never disclosed on the public record. And um, they, you know, BSW is, is so huge, they produce 2,500,000 ,000 tons per annum, okay? So, you know, these, these metrics in the steel industry are measured in 1,000 tons per annum, 2,500,000 tons per annum is what is produced uh, scrap steel into four hours, says their website. And, you know, after this network intrusion incident, uh, BSW reported that not only did their production come to a halt, but they were required to furlough or, or temporarily lay off 850 employees. This is hugely impactful. And in Germany, um, because of some of the, the, the laws and, and legal regulations around workers and labor, a lot of them, uh, you know, have to be paid, uh, compensated for the fact that they were furloughed. You know, this doesn't just mean they were sent home without pay. So this absolutely had a huge impact on BSW. Financially, we don't know what those numbers are. Uh, if I ever do find out, I will absolutely come back and correct this record and update our information. Perhaps I'll have something in time for the 2024 threat report. Now, what's interesting about this attack to me also is, uh, and, and I hope it will be to you as well, is that there are a lot of parallels with this incident to a um, former cyber attack that was reported in 2015 by the German BSI. And in that case, they reported back in 2015 that an undisclosed steel mill was impacted by a cyber attack and it caused massive damage. Um, so in this case, we had a production shutdown uh, for about a day and 850 employees sent home. Um, for a production day or so. But back then, the massive damage was caused because the, the blast furnace and the molten steel actually cooled down in the smelting units, uh, which likely required all of them to be completely replaced or rebuilt. And um, in this case, I'm really just not sure. That, you know, I've checked to see if there's been a follow-up to see if this 2015 cyber attack is somewhat related. We don't actually know. But what we do know is that there are very, very few steelworks in the world in the region and there's a chance that they may be connected good to know uh by the way this has been referred to the police in the region who knows we might see something come out of this next incident americold and that cactus gang it sounds like you know some some amazing movie, perhaps maybe some of these will be turned into a movie one day. Uh, what does Americold do? Well, they provide a vast network of frozen and refrigerated warehouses and services to logistical companies. So the way this works is that if you need to move anything that must be refrigerated or chilled or frozen in logistics and, and shipping industry, you can account on Americold typically to be there for you when you need to drop something off leave it in cold storage you can contract them and and you know they're so large they have 250 warehouses globally that can supply the logistic industry with this service and you might not be aware but the amount of refrigeration that this requires in 250 giant warehouses is is quite significant it requires a lot of automation and monitoring 
And there is a lot of communications between docks, between trucks at docks that have chilled uh, trailers. And all of this is, is strictly controlled. It's logged, it's monitored. You know, think of the logging at 250 sites, you know, with thousands of hectares of, of chilled storage and, and how much data that is and, and the challenge to make sure that, you know, when a customer contracts them to keep things at, I don't know, minus four degrees Celsius, that, that they can count on making sure that it's that temperature or if they need colder or warmer, that they can count on these kind of conditions. So it's quite, a, quite automation intensive. And on April 25th, uh, Americ Americold detected and shut down their network to contain a cyber attack. And they stated that they began to rebuild their systems. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, they mentioned to, you know, to the public, to their customers, that they were unable to accept logistical inbound and all but critically perishable outbound deliveries at cold storage facilities. So in other words, unless you had something that was about to spoil that was currently in storage with them, they were not able to help you. Uh, nothing got in or out unless it was about to go bad and spoil in the facility, in which case the implication is that they would have handled those situations manually. And employees and customers uh, reported on Reddit that global ops were shut down. This is one of the reasons why we know the global ops were shut down. They didn't actually say this in their public company statement, but we do know that this happened because of, of public reports on social media by employees. And in July, much, much later on in the year, uh, finally, we found out um, more information. The Cactus Ransomware Group, which is a brand new ransomware gang that seems to have shown up in March, uh, claimed responsibility on the dark web. Um, Cactus is relatively new. It's a double extortion ransomware gang that likes to exploit VPN appliances to gain initial access and a foothold in the network. And they use a new type of malware, a unique type of malware that's been created uh, that has an encryptor binary. So, you know, double extortion ransomware is where you have, first of all, you know, encryption of information and computers, and also exfiltration of data, you know, to blackmail uh, people over later. So their encryption, uh, their, their first ransomware method is to use it in a uh, binary that will go and encrypt all your systems. And it is created in such a way to evade endpoint detection systems. So they have basically unique key that can get randomly changed when they deploy their encryption binary, encryptor binary. And basically it will be signed with a different code every time, uh, change the binary signature and, and attempt to avoid endpoint detection. So it's something new uh, you should be aware about. Finally, just this week on Monday, Americold confirmed that they were a cactus victim. They, they came out and said it. And they also said critically that 130,000 employees and their dependents' personal info was leaked during this. So not only did they lose a lot of production for over a week, uh, which cost them dearly, uh, you know, this data exfiltration is extremely damaging to them. Um, the information that was exfiltrated included name, address, social security number, driver's license, state ID numbers, passport numbers, financial accounts, which includes bank account and credit card numbers, health insurance and medical information, basically everything, you know, the worst nightmare uh, was exfiltrated on all employees and their dependents. Um, you know, this was a very significant incident for them. Uh, it cost them quite a lot. Um, Americold, by the way, was also previously hit by ransomware in 2020, which also impacted operations and resulted in a data breach. And perhaps these kind of HVAC controls are, are perceived as simple systems that need to be treated more seriously, especially when large numbers of sites and customers are involved. What I do know about this trucking industry is, you know, this telemetry, as I said, between all these systems is significant and, um, you know, is treated mostly like an IT network when perhaps it should be treated more like an operational control system um, and, and segmented more heavily and, and more protections perhaps would help mitigate these kind of problems. Next incident. This is probably, if I could pick a number one from 2023, this would probably be the one. Uh, this is also an incident that I'd like to stress right from the get-go is actually a near miss. So let's get into the details. So um, sandworm near miss on Danish critical energy. And, and what, what occurred here is that 22 critical energy infrastructure companies in Denmark were hit 
by a novel nation-state attack, uh, which Sector Cert has attributed to Sandworm, which, uh, if you're not familiar, has been around for quite a long time. They're actually uh, widely believed and known to be a division of the Russian GRU, main intelligence directorate. So this is part of military intelligence. In other words, they're a nation state, well-organized, well-funded, well-resourced group of state hackers supported by the Russian government. Okay, well, you know, this is a lot of information. You know, where's all this coming from? How did we get here? Well, what Sector Cert is in, in Denmark is a an organization that has sensors deployed, hundreds and hundreds of sensors deployed throughout critical infrastructure networks in Denmark. And so their job is to sit in the network outside and, and connecting all national infrastructure in Denmark together and through network taps basically examine all packets and information traveling throughout the network and effectively look for bad guys for actors like sandworm or ransomware and they have the ability to do this on at a deep packet level and on may 11th alarms started to go off on all their sensor networks and they saw something that significantly alarmed them so their signature analysis and, and their alarm system was sending them alarm bells that they had a major problem and the signature of these attacks looked like sandworm so sandworm has been active in the past in other attacks and this information has been shared amongst private and government agencies and so this is how they're able to tell and attribute this attack to sandworm i think it's very credible um and and I want to underline again that this attack had no physical consequences that were made public. So as far as we know, nothing got shut down here. Um, so I classify this as a near miss. You know, a, what is a near miss? This is an incident where if the situation would have only been slightly different, it would have resulted in physical consequences. Normally, we don't put these in our threat reports because, as I said, we focus only on incidents with uh, physical consequences. But I can't not mention this attack. And one of the other reasons this is a near miss is because without the dedicated, extremely hard work of Sector Cert and their employees and and uh, and personnel traveling personally to site to 22 different you know power and energy oil and gas sites in Denmark and working with employees of those critical energy infrastructure companies, we don't really know, but likely there would have been a physical incident. This is at least what they've said in the report. You can use the QR code here to go and download the report directly. You can Google for it. Just download, uh, search Google for Sector Cert, uh, Danish Critical Infrastructure. You'll find it quite quickly. Um, I encourage you to go and read this report. It's very rare that we have a lot of details on cyber attacks. And this is one of the few cases where they have disclosed, for example, that Zixel firewalls were the ones that were exploited by in waves of attacks. There were waves where they exploited known vulnerabilities that were just recently published by Zixel. Zixel encouraged all their customers to go and update, but not everybody was able to do so in time. They also disclosed that there were uh, apparent zero day attacks, single packet, single packets of information were able to completely compromise these Zixel firewalls. And uh, throughout, you know, 22 different companies at the IT to internet interface. So to be clear, they said that they detected these attacks and stopped them at the boundary of the internet to their IT networks. Um, so yes, if you're interested in no more details, please go and download Sector Search Report, read it, understand it, and and. Uh, you know, feedback is welcome. Welcome. Should I have included this in the top 10 today? Uh, I leave it to you. If you think, yes, Reese, you know, you should have included it. Please let me know through the comments. If you think this is okay, you know, much ado about nothing. Uh, you know, we, we avoided this attack it should not have been in here. Please let me know. I take all feedback. I welcome it all.
Next incident, number seven, a Lockbit ransomware attack infects Granules India. So Granules India is a large, very large generic drug manufacturer based in Hyderabad, India. They supply the world with generic medicines that are off patent. This includes uh, medicines like Tylenol and aspirin, and they're extremely important. They, they make a lot of money. Uh, they're very, very big. And what occurred here on May 20th is that they suffered a Lockbit ransomware attack. It shut down the production for over 40 days. This is a significant amount of time. Um, Sure, there have been other ransomware attacks that have shut down production for longer than 40 days, but 40 days is probably one of the biggest amounts of downtime we've seen in 2023 that was on the public record. And um, cost, the CEO reported a significant loss of revenue here. Major effect on operations due to significant changes in our IT systems, they stated through the India Times. Um. Let's move on quickly to the next because we're running out of time. We've got about six minutes left. Uh, somebody, by the way, through the questions asks, does the report go into more detail on the attack vectors of the attacks? Um, possibly, you know, all the attack vectors that you see or attack uh, types that you see here um, are what we know from public sources of information. Um, if we have the details, we will publish them or at least provide you with a link to those attack details. The sector cert example is, is one of them where we, we can provide you those details. Okay, moving on, number eight, Brunswick Corporation. Um, Brunswick Corporation is a manufacturer, discrete manufacturer of um, outboard motors and small watercraft. They have customers uh, in the US government, in law enforcement, and for you know many people worldwide that like to go boating and fishing. In this case, uh, example where we simply do not know how the attack occurred. Uh, it was never made public, but we do know that it did occur. And the company reported uh, through their CEO, actually, um, to investors in August. They suffered a major cyber attack, which forced them to shut down their production systems for 17 days. It impacted distribution, so they were not able to ship their product. And it cost up to $85 million. Again, it's possible that they actually did pay a ransom in this case, which is why it was never uh, publicly known. Nobody took responsibility for this attack. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, what we do know is the information that the company provided to investors and investor meeting. But $85 million is a significant amount of money for a company like Mercury Marine. Again, we're short on time. Moving on to number nine, scattered spider causes chaos at MGM resorts. This is a toss up. The sector sort one was a um, near miss. This is an actual attack with physical consequences. Uh, some people might debate whether we should include this in a report. Uh, does this really fit the profile of industrial or automation systems? and OT systems. Well, I believe it did. And here's why is that because unlike many, many other attacks on casinos and resorts and hotels that we've seen in the past, and other forms of building automation, this is one that completely shut down operations for over 10 days at one of the largest hotel and casino operators in the world. MGM Resorts is huge. All, all their 19 hotels and casinos in the Las Vegas Strip lost physical access to rooms. You know, when you go to a hotel or a casino nowadays and you you choose to stay there, you can't get into rooms anymore with a physical key. You need a key card. And those systems were all disabled in this attack, including the ATMs and their phones. Um, ability to pay and book rooms was impacted by this. But for me, the real determining factor here why this is a, an attack on an OT system was because of the room keys and physical access was denied to all their properties in the Las Vegas Strip. On September 12th, they disclosed in, a, in an SEC AK filing um, that it cost them $110 million total, $100 million in lost revenue, and $10 million in direct costs to restore operations and pay for services, cybersecurity services to, to get back to normal. Um, this is just one of the most costly attacks I have ever seen. 
Um, $110 million is a huge amount of money. Um, we have a lot more information about this attack. We we know that um, in this case, Scattered Spider is a brand new ransomware threat actor that uh, unlike usual, uh, they're most likely US and uh, UK based attackers in their very early 20s. Law enforcement is very struggling, uh, is struggling very hard right now to to find and and prosecute and go after these threat actors, which we uh, which many people believe is possible, but they're very you know, and they compromised uh, the initial access here into MGM was actually through the help desk. Scattered Spider actually went through social media profiles. They uh, created a spear phishing campaign uh, for the help desk, claimed that they were an employee that weren't able to get into. The network and the help desk unfortunately granted the threat actor access through through this type of social engineering technique. And then once they did get in, they encrypted up to 100 VMware ESXi servers, which had a known vul vulnerability this year and caused this chaos for MGM. Okay, moving on. Uh, the last one of the year was an attack on four Australian ports. Now, DP World is a Dubai-based owner of ports all around the world. They own and operate ports. And four of Australia's ports were impacted in the cyber attack. Again, we know very little about the actual attack. Because this is such a significant attack on the country of Australia uh, and impacted four ports for three days in Melbourne, Fremantle, Botany, and Brisbane, and caused a 10 day backlog of 30,000 containers, uh, you know, basically the Australian government is now involved. The estimate of costs is in the millions of dollars. So it's over at least 1 million. And uh, I'll just leave you here with a quote from Air Marshal Darren Goldie, who was live on ABC News in Australia. And this is what he said. He said, DP World's IT system remains disconnected from the internet, and they continue to have significantly reduced ability to move cargo across the ports. Um, later on, the company stated to Reuters, Reuters news agency that no ransomware was found deployed within the DP World Australia network. And um, to give you an idea of the scale here, um, a statistic is that DP World Australia manages 40% of all goods that flow in and out of the country. So this is the last and final cyber attack of the year that I considered should be in the top 10. I'm almost out of time here. I want to go very quickly through a couple other slides. Um, if you're not aware, there is a new book by Andrew Ginter, my colleague here in the industrial cybersecurity team. Um, if you want to know more about cyber attacks like these, you can see that in chapter three and appendix A of this book. Uh, this book is available uh, as a free paperback courtesy of Waterfall. And you can use the QR code and the URL down at the bottom of the screen to go and register for your own copy. You know, we try and send this to anybody who requests one. Just a note that there are some regions in the world where unfortunately we may not be able to ship. Um, for some people, there's also an Amazon Kindle version available. I think there's a minimal charge because, you know, there's just no way around it. You just can't give away free Kindle books uh, digitally on Amazon's web store. So there's a very, very small cost there. Um, but go ahead and grab this book. It's filled with resources on how to protect and avoid the kinds of incidents that we have seen in the top 10 here today. Um, about waterfall security, very quickly, we uh, are a company founded in 2007. We have verticals and customers and deployments all around the world. Uh, we're globally located, Israeli-based company. Um, that has offices in the U.S., in Dubai, in Australia, uh, and in Europe, and uh, provide cybersecurity services and, and products and solutions that can solve these kinds of problems that you may encounter that you've seen today here in the top 10. And lastly, you know, what's our claim to fame? Well, waterfall security makes unidirectional security gateways. They allow traffic to flow in only one direction in hardware with a fiber optic laser on the industrial network send side that can send information in only one direction out to a corporate network. This allows you absolute protection 
where the gateway hardware is physically able to send information in only one way, uh, but complete network visibility. So you can now share information out of your industrial or OT network with the corporate network without any fear of information getting back in the reverse direction. How do we do this? Well, there are software connectors that can replicate and mirror almost any kind of industrial protocol or information source that you might encounter. Uh, and so that no attack, no matter how sophisticated, can propagate back into the industrial network through the gateway. Um, we often get asked the question, so what if I need to send information back into my industrial network? Don't worry, we have you covered with a wide range of products and solutions. A quick call to our solution architects can set up a meeting that can they can sit down with you and, and ask you some questions about your application and your needs and find a solution that fits your network and that can solve your OT and ICS cybersecurity problems. And I, after all this talking, I'd like to hand it back over to Natalia for Q and A. Thank you, Reese. That was very interesting and informative presentation. Um, we've got a few questions from the audience. So uh, one of them is uh, in regards to our annual threat report. Um, sure. Since you're a lead researcher, can you tell us? Uh, when will the 2024 report be released and what do this year's attack numbers look like so far? Yes, a very common question. Everybody likes to ask me that. I've got a slide just for this. So let's let's talk about this slide that I didn't speak to and also talk about these two questions. So first of all, um, the research is, is nearly complete. We need to finalize information from December and then the report should be released in the first quarter of 2024. So last year, the report came out um, much later, perhaps, than we would have liked, but it came out nonetheless um, in the second quarter of the year. This year, we're on track to, to releasing this in the first quarter of the year, so expect that soon. Uh, as for what the, the numbers look like, we're still finalizing them. Uh, we put a lot of, of effort into ensuring that this is the most credible report out there. We won't include incidents that are doubtful, that... Um, are not clearly showing any physical consequences. And so because of that, there's a review process that we have to go through. What I can tell you is that so far, it looks like that we will absolutely um, have more incidents this year than we did last. <clears throat> so definitely expect more incidents with physical consequences than we saw last year. Uh, are there any other questions or did I, did I answer that person's question sufficiently, Natalia? I, I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is another question. Would it be possible to include um, high-level attack vectors for future presentation if they're available? Yeah, so in this presentation, <clears throat> I did include them. They were on each slide. So if you missed them or I didn't speak to them directly, uh, please download the recording and go through them again. As I said, in some cases, we simply don't know what they are. I'm not going to throw out an attack with physical consequences for our report uh, if ju just because it doesn't include what the attack vector was or the attack incident details are. But well, what I have always committed to and, and what we commit to here at Waterfall is that if we do find out later on what those attack uh, types were or the method in which somebody breached into the OT network, we update the record. So one of the things you'll see in the 2024 report that will be coming out shortly is actually an update on incidents that we've previously reported that will include this uh, attack type. Uh, now, attack vector is, is a word that I've used in a previous presentation. I've actually, you know, we're not sure what we're going to call this yet. Uh, attack vector is actually already used in the cybersecurity community to mean something slightly different. So we might actually end up defining this differently. But however you want to spin it, yes, our commitment is to, to look at, at these attack types and try and understand, you know, what's the most frequent type? Uh, what do they look like? What's the trends look like in, in attack types? <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Thank you, Reese. Um, One of the questions we have, um, given that many OT outages are because of IT attacks, should we prioritize IT protection this coming year? 
Yes, absolutely. No doubt in my mind. So there, there's a couple of things here that we can talk about, you know, pulling back from the, the data and the details. Ultimately, one of the things about cyber attacks in general and threat actors is uh, it's extremely hard to predict the future. We don't really know what motivations cyber threat actors might have in the future. Uh, sometimes we don't even really know what their motivations are today and in the past. We can make educated guesses, but these are people that are, you know, over a long period of time, you see interviews, you see information that they release. Can you trust them? I mean, they're, they're cyber criminals. So how can you trust people that, uh, that are criminals whose job it is, is to lie to you, uh, to distract and, and, and effectively just aren't trustworthy. Um, what are their motivations and they can change at any moment. And one of the things that's happening is a shift in motivation we are starting to see a shift uh, in ransomware threat actors. Some groups have publicly stated that they are now no longer going to target OT and only go after data exfiltration because it's so lucrative for them. Uh, other ones have boasted about their OT cyber attack capabilities. And at the moment, uh, all, I, all I can say for sure is that they tend to go after people with money. And this is what they love more than anything. So if there's an easy way low-hanging fruits, so to speak, where they can go after and get you for money, they will. Um, this does not mean that you should stop putting resources into OT cybersecurity um, because perhaps today you might see more attacks on IT once they've exhausted that environment and, and milked, you know, uh, for the lack of a better term, uh, IT networks and uh, data exfiltration as a way of making money they're simply going to turn to another way that they can leverage people for more money, which will likely be OT networks. And so if you choose to not put effort into protecting your OT networks this year <clears throat> or next, based on previous information, uh, thinking that perhaps the, the tide has shifted into attacking only IT networks, I think that would be a, a serious critical mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Riz. Um, one more question we have. Uh, hold on. Um, out of all these incidents in 2023, why did you choose those uh, 10 specifically? Why did I choose these 10? Yeah. Um, I basically went through the record of all the incidents we had, and I looked at the ones where we knew what the financial cost was, or we knew what the physical consequences were. And I looked at ones that had the largest amount of downtime, the largest cost to restore or, or respond to the cyber attack. And I, and I picked those ones. And I also picked a few like the um, near miss on Danish critical infrastructure that I believed could not be discounted. In this case, it's very rare to see a nation state attack uh, especially one with a lot of uh, details on the incident in terms of the type of network packets, the, the ports that were attacked, um, the type of malware or vulnerabilities that were uh, deployed uh, in order to try and penetrate the system. So uh, that was a, another type of incident that I, that I had to include because, um, you know, if you've seen my intro video on social media, I, I, I picked ones that were the most notorious. I consider that notorious. And, and impactful. Uh, there have been some yeah. more, by the way, Natalia, just to finish off, that have occurred sure. literally in the last couple of weeks that I would have loved to include on this list that would have been in contention. And I just want to say that they just simply, you know, are so new and so fresh. Uh, I haven't been able to include them in this presentation. You know, it's just wasn't possible in time. Go no, ahead. no worries. <laughs> Um, we have a question about uh, major competitors on the OT domain. I don't know if you want to address that one. Sure. Um, oh, sorry, what was the question? Uh, as a waterfall product portfolio, who are the major competition in the OT domain, which 
vendors, brands? Sure. Actually, we have Andrew Ginter on the line, who I think is probably best positioned to answer this. Andrew, do you have any thoughts on on who our major competitors would be? Um, yeah, so let me uh, say a couple of things. Um, if you, you know, Google unidirectional gateway, you'll find a lot of vendors out there in the data diode space. Um, there's a lot of unidirectional stuff out there. Um, you know, what you, what you have to do is uh, look carefully at each of the vendors that come up and there's uh, 70 or 80 of them. Um, and, you know, most of them have similar hardware. What you need to do is understand the software. The NIST standard uh, uh, defines a unidirectional gateway as uh, one-way hardware with software that makes copies of servers. And so you need to look at uh, the, the software capabilities as well as the strength of the hardware. Um, while I, sorry to, 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 to interrupt here, I, uh, I, I did see one other question that I wanted to get to. Um, what's going on if the attack occurs on the OT network? Your solution does not protect against this kind of attack, I believe, you know, what do you do? Um, let me rephrase the question. I understand that question to be asking, look, if someone carries a cell phone into the OT network and you know foolishly connects it to a USB port and something jumps off of the cell phone into the network, that's a very bad thing. Um, and uh, you know in in my new book, I position uh, the solution in a sense as a coin with two sides. One side of the coin is cybersecurity teach engineers about cyber risks, you know, use cybersecurity solutions in, in engineering space. The other side of the coin is engineering. Network engineering is sort of where the, the waterfall solution plays. What we need is the whole coin. Okay, we're not choosing one side of the coin or the other. When you spend a coin, you spend the whole coin. Nobody buys a unidirectional gateway and puts their feet in the desk and says, there, I'm done. It's all over. No. We need both the strong network security to prevent the pervasive threat, which is, you know, bad guys coming in over the internet and doing stuff to us. Pretty much all of these attacks, in my understanding, came across the internet. Um, we also need to deal with everything else, which is insiders that are malicious, insiders that have been deceived. And so we need the full program of identify, protect, detect, respond, recover um, on both sides, you know, of the, of, of the unidirectional gateway. The gateway takes a very important threat vector entirely off the table, but we still have other threat vectors that need to be addressed. So we need the, the full solution to one degree or another. Sorry to, 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 to jump in there. I, I, I saw a complicated question there recent. I felt- No, complicated. that's, no, that's fine. I mean, it's your book and, and you say it so well in that book. Um, one of the things that I really love about your book is the the details and the depth you go into uh, about how both both traditional IT cybersecurity solutions and new cybersecurity OT cybersecurity engineering solutions are needed to address the problem and uh, the holistic nature of of addressing this problem. You know, I, I think you answered it beautifully, probably better than I could. Um, the only thing I would add is that. You know, when it comes to solutions to solving uh, cyber attacks, you have to look at all threats, including, uh, you know, threats that could be internal to the network. And and yes, you know, the, this this question we have from the audience about, um, you know, your product, uh, does it solve uh, threats that, that might be coming in, uh, you know, other than through a remote network connection? Um, no, I mean, you need a combination of solutions to address all risks and your book you know, talks about that in a brilliant way. It's designed for managers at a high level and yet has enough details that I think it's it's an incredibly important desk reference for anybody in the ICS OT cybersecurity community. Thank you, Reese and Andrew. Um, I think we covered it all. Um, Reese, do you want to, any last words? No. Um... I'm just, you know, 
busy typing answers to questions here. Uh, and, and I will mention that uh, we will make every effort to, to address all questions uh, if we didn't get to them here in, in the webinar. And I wanted to, um, it's a holiday season for many, uh, whether it's Hanukkah or, or Christmas and, and New Year's for people around the world. It's the last webinar of the year. I want to wish everybody a, a wonderful end of the year and all the best for the next year. Uh, for everybody here joining us today, um, you know, one of the things I like about New Year's Day is you get to think about what you change and what you do better for the next year. I know that for many of us here in the OTICS cybersecurity community, we're always looking at better solutions and improving uh, our, our security posture at solving these, these difficult problems. And um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to examine this year in review and and look to see you know how we would do things differently for the next one and and i hope you all make wonderful plans and and have a good rest over the holiday season and i want to say thank you natalia for organizing all this thank you reese this was tremendous i look forward to your threat report in uh, 2024 thank you andrew you know i you make it sound like it's my report, but I but I know you're a big contributor too. So yes, uh, I'm very I'm very much looking forward to put this out. It's it's going to be fantastic. Um, always great insights, and and I just love the the feedback we get uh, when we do publish reports like this. So yes, thank you, Andrew, and and also thank you, Natalia, for putting this all together. Thank you, and once again, on behalf of uh, Waterfall, we thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you next time in the new year. See you. Bye. Bye.